Did being a leper in the Middle Ages mean to be regarded as a holy person, to be treated as an outcast, both or neither? I'm Lucy, and I'll be exploring these questions on this week's episode of Footnoting History. Through the 19th century, most historians assumed that medieval lepers were universally regarded with fear and loathing. After all, it was the Middle Ages, when everyone was dirty, smelly, and superstitious. But even as historians started applying new methods to the study of the Middle Ages, lepers and leprosy remained, well, ostracized from the revision of ideas. Part of the problem is that different types of medieval sources give very different impressions of leprosy. Cultural and religious historians have often claimed that leprosy was viewed as a mark and consequence of sin. And indeed, Jacques de Vitry, among other less famous medieval preachers, is on record as telling lepers to repent. The thing is, medieval preachers are on record as telling just about everyone to repent. Leprosy was sometimes used as a metaphor for sin, a disfigurement of the body, as sin is a disfigurement of the soul. But the records of towns and hospitals do not indicate that lepers were treated as especially sinful. Lepers were required to confess their sins before taking up residence in a hospital, but so were all the other sick who sought admission. Before I say anything else about medieval hospitals, perhaps I should say that they were a thing. This often comes as a surprise to people to whom I say, I study medieval hospitals at cocktail parties. The medieval hospital became an increasingly independent and distinctive institution from the middle of the 12th century onwards. Until that point, hospitals were usually found attached to monasteries, where sick monks and sick travelers were cared for side by side. The 12th century saw an enormous boom in the religious life, and a lot of new ideas about what practicing the religious life meant. New orders and communities sprang up, but that's kind of another story. Hospitals were seen as holy places, and caring for the sick was seen as holy work. So, men and women who wanted to enter on a religious way of life, or an apostolic way of life, to use a phrase that was popular at the time, the Vita Apostolica, could take service in a hospital, which offered considerably more flexibility than entrance into an order. Evidence from wills, leases, and rent agreements suggests that it was not uncommon for people to dedicate their own houses as mini-hospitals of sorts, where one or two lepers or other sick persons could live and support themselves from alms and the work of their hands. That serving the sick was both popular and seen as very holy is reflected in the number of 13th century saints on record as caring for the sick. Even before she took vows as a nun, St. Clara of Assisi took on the care of lepers, washing them, bandaging their sores, feeding them, and making cheerful small talk. Now, I mention the cheerful small talk because this, no less than the bandaging and washing, was seen as part of medieval medicine. Keeping patients cheerful was one way to help keep their humors balanced and their bodies ready to heal themselves. A very holistic approach. Anyway, all of Claire's work with lepers was most impressive to St. Francis because he thought lepers were gross. I mean, they were disfigured. They had wounds that oozed pus. Before they were given baths, they were really smelly. St. Francis' biographer tells us all this before explaining that Francis felt really bad about this, prayed about it, and was duly given divine grace to not mind being around lepers anymore, so that he not only cared for them, but would joyfully carry them around, if they found walking difficult, and kiss them. Edifying stories in sermon collections tell of similar episodes, of holy lay persons taking lepers into their homes, and being rewarded for their charity by having the leper transform into Christ. Some have argued that these stories were popular precisely because nearly everyone found lepers scary and gross, and tried to isolate them whenever possible. This would make it all the more holy, obviously, to carry them about and kiss them instead. But if people were attempting to isolate lepers in the 12th and 13th centuries, they were shockingly inefficient about it. As archaeologists and others have demonstrated, leprosaria, hospitals dedicated specially to the care of lepers, were often located outside city walls. But this on its own cannot be taken as a sign of an attempt at isolation. Other hospitals were also located outside city walls, as were a number of other religious houses, monasteries and convents, that is, founded about the same time. This was convenient for all of them as they often functioned as hotels, or, shall we say, hostels, as the circumstances were modest, for travelers. 
and travelers' alms in turn formed an important source of income for them. Hospitals remained often stubbornly multi-purpose institutions. The Heilige Geistspital, or Hospital of the Holy Spirit, in Mainz, Germany, for instance, is defined in its statutes from the year 1236 as a worthy place dedicated to God, in which, always, sick people and pilgrims may find a place of welcome, in which the weary may find rest, in which the hungry may find food, the thirsty drink, and all others, rich and poor alike, welcome and appropriate care. You may correctly infer that medieval statutes were often wordy. Not all statutes, however, were quite as detailed, not to say verbose, as those of Mainz's Heiligkeitsspital. But in similar 13th century hospital rules, there were quite often specifications like those about whom the hospital was to serve. Only residents of the city, or travelers as well. The poor and needy only, or anyone who happened by. Lepers, or no lepers. Where lepers are excluded, they are often found in lists of all sorts of undesirable categories of persons, unwanted at the hospital in question. These persons might be thieves, or beggars, deemed to be potentially disruptive. Having calm and quiet was seen as a key part of maintaining a hospital environment. They might also be abandoned babies, or people with chronic illness, or burning sores, or pregnant women, or lepers. No one has suggested that medieval people were universally afraid of or trying to segregate abandoned babies or pregnant women or people with sores, for that matter. What all these categories of people, including lepers, do have in common is that they would have required more specialized and intensive medical care than all hospitals would have been equipped to provide. So there were foundling hospitals, homes for pregnant women, and leprosaria. Like those of other hospitals, the statutes of Leprosaria laid out the rights, privileges, and duties of its residents, both healthy and sick. The staff were to serve the lepers quietly and respectfully. Some of the statutes add a helpful reminder that the lepers are among the poor of Christ and to be treated as such. The responsibilities of the lepers are also listed. For instance, that they are not to go out into the town without permission of the hospital master. Likewise, that they are not to buy and sell goods in the marketplace without permission. They are, of course, to participate in the liturgy, in so far as their health permits them to do, and to pray for the souls of all hospital donors. At Chartres, the prohibitions on socializing with healthy townspersons are especially detailed. If a leper has dinner with a healthy person, the leper is to be punished, and if the healthy person extended the dinner invitation in the first place, he or she is to be punished, too. This is the type of prohibition often pointed to as evidence of concern for segregation, and an absolute ban on lepers and non-lepers eating dinner with each other certainly does look like a quarantine attempt. And what was the punishment for sharing dinner? To go without wine for one day. Now, if this was an attempt at keeping lepers totally separate from the non-leprous, all I can say is the statute writers of Chartres were approximately as efficient as Monty Python's King Arthur. But, like the prohibitions on buying, selling, and spending the night in the town, the no-wine-for-you edict, as I like to call it, does make sense if regarded as an attempt to make sure that all the lepers were obeying the hospital master. This brings us back to an earlier point. Hospitals were regarded very much as religious institutions. And just as monks and nuns were expected to obey their elected superiors, hospital residents were expected to obey the masters of the hospital. Hospital administrators might be appointed by the founders of a hospital, priests of the parish, the town council, the local bishop, the members of a monastery which ran the hospital, or the sick persons themselves. The latter option was understandably more common in Leprosaria, where many of the sick were semi-permanent residents, and in a number of cases the masters of Leprosaria were themselves lepers as well. The principle of obedience was one of the things which enabled the hospital's smooth day-to-day -day functioning. It was also important because not only were hospitals regarded as religious institutions in broad cultural terms, but they were treated as religious institutions under ecclesiastical law. Attempts to regulate hospitals, then, can be seen as following the same lines as attempts to regulate other religious houses and orders in the 13th and early 14th centuries. Religious houses, including hospitals, enjoyed tax exemptions as well as spiritual cachet. 
and for both these reasons, church officials wanted to make sure that these houses weren't just, well, doing whatever. Since hospitals were often unaffiliated with a specific religious order, they managed to evade attempts at discipline and control for an unusually long time. Until the middle of the 13th century, male and female staff worked side by side in hospitals, at a time when mixed-gender monasteries were almost unheard of. And lack of affiliation meant that hospitals could, to a significant extent, make up the rules as they went along and interpret them however they wanted. In many, possibly most, of these hospitals, lepers were cared for alongside the other sick. One difference between lepers and the other sick poor was that lepers, perhaps because they were most likely to be long-term or permanent residents, were sometimes given a trial period, a bit like a monk's novitiate, to see if they liked the hospital and wanted to stay. Lepers were singled out by saints and sermon writers not because they were dramatically different from all the other sick and poor and vulnerable who found their way into hospitals. Rather, they were singled out because they were so usefully like the other sick and poor who received welcome and appropriate care. And, unless they broke the rules, plenty of wine to go with it. This has been Footnoting History. If you liked our podcast, be sure to check us out on the web at footnotinghistory.com, like us on our Facebook page, and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Join us next week when we'll be talking about the history of dieting. Until then, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week!